Tonight, we have insight from the big winner of the final debate, Chris Wallace. He'll give us some scoop on Clinton and Trump. Plus, Charlie Leduff breaks down the battle between the establishment and the Trump movement and where we go from here. Plus, our pollster Matt Towery has new numbers and projections. This is Money, Power, and Politics. Okay, let's start with 2016 from the mouths of babes. These second and fourth graders pretty much summed up what a lot of grown-ups are thinking. If you guys could vote, who would you vote for? I would vote for nobody. Same. I Same. Would for no one. Nobody. I would just want Obama again. Yeah, funny how President Obama was strapped with low approval ratings for much of his time in office, could not break the gridlock in Congress, and by his own admission, failed to bring us together as he had hoped. But his approval rating shot up when voters weighed him against the choices to replace him. It's obviously very stressful. I think as a young person too, um, our future, it's kind of scary that these are the two candidates they pulled together. And that's the state of the race less than three weeks to election day. We have the two most unpopular nominees in modern history, deep rooted anger on both sides, and psychiatrists say it's hurting people across the nation. We're getting so many phone calls, start seeing more patients, because their anxiety level, which wasn't stable before, it's coming back. People are losing sleep. Well, in just a few minutes, we'll show you how the race is also affecting friendships and disrupting people's lives right here in Tampa Bay and what comes next no matter who wins. But first, we'll key into the new poll numbers and how the third debate may have changed things. We also have some perspective from debate moderator Chris Wallace. He sat down with Russell Rhodes on Good Day and told us what Trump said to him after the debate. I got to tell you, my friend, I was a nervous wreck for you, and then when it was all said and done, I couldn't have been prouder of you. You were great. You were great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, I, that was true for a lot of my friends and family, <laughs> and I'm glad to know that, that you and Tampa were sitting there as, as a nervous wreck. I, it's, a, it's a daunting experience, and I will say for at least the ten, first 10 minutes of the debate, uh, I heard this voice asking questions, and I'm thinking, who is that? And of course, it's me. It was kind of an out-of-body experience. <laughs> but then about 10 minutes in, I kind of relaxed and, and had a good time. I mean, it, it's very challenging because, yeah. you know, it's not just the questions that you have prepared, and I had prepared and researched a, a, a ton of them, but it's also those kind of on-the-fly, instinctual decisions you have to make. When do I interrupt? When do I let him go? Do I let, bring him back to the subject matter? I mean, we had a discussion of immigration that turned into the Middle East and yeah. Russia. But, you know, if, if they were, it's sort of like a referee in a prize fight. If they're fighting cleanly, then you let them go. After the debate, Hillary Clinton came up and shook your hand. Donald Trump stayed back for a second. And then he came over and shook your hand. And he stayed there a little bit longer and, and talked to you. Was it was it a friendly exchange right then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just real quickly, Clinton came and she said, thank you. And then it was interesting because the way this stage is opposed to some of the others where her husband and her daughter yeah. and uh, could just walk right up. There was there was a security barrier and there were some stairs uh, and they, so they couldn't get there. And she said, do you think I can go down there? And I said, well, secretary, I think you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so she walked down. Then Trump came. Uh, and clearly had kind of waited to let her go because they didn't want to be in each other's yeah. face very much. Uh, and he said, uh, good job, and I th that he thought it was the best of the debate. So, no, it was very friendly and complimentary, and even despite the fact that I'd obviously asked him some tough questions, um, but, but it, was, it, it was very friendly. We'll talk soon. We'll see you Sunday, okay? Thank you, Russell, and, and you, you can stop being nervous for me. It's okay. <laughs> good. Good. I, it's over. It's over. I can breathe again. See you later. Okay, good perspective from Chris Wallace. And now time for some insight from our Fox 13 pollster, Matt Towery. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We have some changes to talk about in Georgia and in Florida, don't we? Yes, we do. And in Florida, we have uh, Hillary Clinton is now leading in this state. She's at 49%. Four points behind is Donald Trump. Uh, whereas in Georgia, you have the complete opposite. Georgia, Trump is leading at 50 percent, and she is 4 percent behind him. We said before, Craig, that the two states voted the same, or were in the polls dovetailing each other. Now we see the separation. Now what drives that separation? What's going on in one state versus the other if they matched up so neatly just a few weeks ago? Well, it tells you television means so much, paid ads. Donald Trump's not running much at all here. There's not, not much television to uh, really speak of, whereas Clinton's organization, the Democrats, 
Democrats are just pounding him on the airwaves, and that's making the difference. In Florida, independents are massively going with Clinton right now, whereas in Georgia, independents are massively going with Trump. The election is November 8th. That's election day, but people are already voting by yeah. the hundreds of thousands across the nation and here in Florida. So if Trump, let's say he's down four points, as your poll shows, our poll shows, at what point can he turn that around and what would he have to do? Well, he still has a chance to turn it around because ironically, the poll also shows that uh, Donald Trump is actually leading among those who say they've early voted. So of the early vote right now, he's not really trailing. So he's got an opportunity if his campaign can get enough sense to put ads on TV and they, if they have some real impact because he's getting a real hurting right now on those ads that are being run against him. But if he could get on television, he has a chance to make it's only a four point difference in both states. I mean, that could really change things. On the other side, in Georgia, if Clinton decides to get on TV, that could become a dead even race as well. You've also got a very, very close race in the Florida Senate race here. Isn't that something? Very close. And you and I were both talking about a couple of days ago the fact that the Democratic Senatorial Committee decided to, to pull out of Florida, which I thought meant, oh, Murphy must be finished. No, he's not finished. He's dead even. So it's really the presidential race that's sort of dragging Rubio down and lifting Murphy up. And uh, I think it's going to be that presidential race that, that both of them are going to have to ride as the wave to get. And they're both advertising, so that's not an issue for them. It's going to be that presidential race that will really drive which one of them wins. In Congress, Republicans have a 60-seat margin, and yet you've got this hand-wringing, this bedwetting, whatever you want to call it, from Republican leaders across the nation fearing they can lose that majority. Do you really think that could happen? Uh, you know, I, I said one other thing in the releases I put out today. I don't trust polls for the first time in my life. I know we're the best. We use the best, and that right. is opinion savvy. And they've been dead on and ranked number three by Bloomberg. But I don't know the turnout model this time. It's such an unusual year. We've had so many crazy things happen. It's possible that, that you could see a wave go one direction and all the Democrats take over both the Senate and the House. It's also possible that we could be wrong about this whole thing and Donald Trump could come sweeping into office and those Republicans would be safe. I don't think the pollsters know this year as much as in the past. How many late deciders are really left out there? People locked in one side or the other? Yeah, but they swing back and forth because we've been able to see that these numbers have ping-ponged back and forth before. We've had polls in the past where Trump was leading here in Florida. They were tied, now four down. Uh, there's time to change. It's those independent voters who are the ones who can go back and forth. They, but I'll tell you how we'll know. The next poll we do, if the undecided is any higher, that will mean that someone's changing their mind. Before someone changes their mind, they go to undecided first. Good insight, Matt. Thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Coming up, Charlie LaDuff shows us how the Republican elite dismissed and dissed the Trumpians and how the Trump movement came out on top. Well, Trump may be down in the polls and the projections strongly favor Hillary Clinton, but you can't say it's over just yet because Trump has shown time and time again that you underestimate him at your own peril. The Republican elite greatly underestimated his movement earlier this year, last year, and Trump won the nomination because working class Republicans rebelled against the establishment. And they specifically rebelled against traditional Republican positions on trade and trickle down economics. And Charlie LaDuff shows us what that means and where we go from here. Because we've become weak, we've become weak. There is a class war among Republicans. In an attempt to explain the populist appeal of Trump, the Manhattan billionaire who lives in a golden skyscraper, Writers for elite Republican magazines have been mocking a hypothetical working class white man named Mike. This make-believe Mike hails from a real-life upstate New York hamlet called Garbit. They describe Mike as a typical Trump voter, an out-of-work welfare cheat, high on Oxycontin, who's abandoned his kids. Instead of whining about Wall Street and trade deals, they write, Mike ought to put down his heroin needle and move to a place where there's work. The truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Economically, they are negative assets. Morally, they're indefensible. Imagine. Big talk from behind a keyboard. So we decided to physically go to Garbit, New York to find Mike, since working class white people like Mike are half the Republican voters. First, it's hard enough just finding Garbit. But you know where Garbit is, by any chance? Oh, I have no clue, to be honest. You know anybody named, in Garbit named Mike? What they need around here is real opportunity, which means they need a real change, which means that they need a U-Haul. If you want to live, get out of Garbit. So I say, what the hell are they talking about? That's insane. So Garbit's just up that way? Yeah, dude, you can buy about it for miles, yeah. 
And once you find the crossroads of Garbit, about 20 miles south of Rochester, you quickly realize there is no Mike from Garbit. I don't think there is any Mike Garbit. There's not a Mike? Not, not that I know of. I don't know everybody, but... No Mike? No Mike. There's no Mike from Garbit. There's a Kevin, whose dad's name is Mike, but no Mike. So let's settle for Kevin. You use heroin, Kevin? No. Um, you miserable? Not really. No, I'm a nurse myself. You're a nurse? You actually work? Yeah, and I actually used to work for General Motors before that. You used to work for General Motors? Yeah, before he moved to Mexico. Kevin, in fact, works two nursing jobs, but still earns less than he did at GM, where he made windshield wiper motors, like his father did, and his grandfather before him. There's a lot of struggling people like Kevin in New York, a state that's lost hundreds of thousands of good paying factory jobs overseas. Xerox, GM, Kodak, Corning, Bausch & Lomb, to name a few. Good thing there's cheap imports at Walmart because Kevin can't afford anything else. Okay, where, where, where's that watch made? Well, it's probably made in China. What's it say right there? Philippines. Made in Philippines. It's a nice shirt you're wearing. Oh, it's probably made in China. Is it? Oh, big, big and dash, I believe. Let me see here. Vietnam, though. Vietnam? Yeah. yeah. Everything else. Where's them shoes, man? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Those are those are probably China. Let me see. Let me see. Indonesia, bro. Indonesia? Yeah. What about your, your, your pants? Oh, those are probably China. Let me see the tag. Indonesia, bro. Kevin doesn't draw a government check, doesn't do drugs, and doesn't even keep beer in his fridge. He is, however, a single parent raising a teenage son, and the son, named Junior, will graduate high school next year and join the Army. Why do you want to do the military so badly? Serve my country. Not very many people plan on doing it. What do you think of your old man? If he wasn't sitting here, what would you tell me, <laughs> what would you tell me about your dad? He's a good, hard worker. Well, going for nursing and everything, coming from a factory, that was probably hard. I love you, I look up to you. Coming from raising me single parent, that's gonna be not one easy. I just want the best what's best for you. You know, I'd rather have you go to college for a year or two and you still want military to go that route. Town, country, family. That's how it goes in places like Garbit, New York. And it would do the political establishment some good to get out of their office towers and visit places like Garbit instead of mocking a man who only exists in their imagination. What have the Republicans done for you? I don't really know, to be honest with you. Watch more of our stories on the trail on our YouTube channel. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics and click subscribe at the top of the page. You'll also find our investigations of money and politics, our humor segments, and prior shows you may have missed. Coming up, we'll go one-on-one -on -one with Florida's Republican Party boss, Blazin Golia. Does he share Trump's concerns about voter fraud? And what does he make of the projections that make Hillary Clinton the heavy favorite? Okay, let's bring in Blaze and Golia, chairman of the Florida Republican Party. Thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Pleasure to be here. Let's start with Trump's claim of, quote, widespread or, quote, tremendous voter fraud. I know voter fraud occurs. We've found it. But do you think it's to the scope of widespread or tremendous, as Trump has claimed? Well, what I'd say is we are seeing some things here in the state of Florida that is cause for some concern. First thing you look at is the Democrat Party nomination for Hillary Clinton was definitely rigged. Bernie Sanders would have had to won each and every state by an average margin of 59 to 41 just to pull even because of the superdelegates. Then we look at the videos with Project Veritas, where you have Democrat operatives clearly and openly talking about gaming the system. And what happened this week in the state of Florida, where the Florida Democrat Party, on behalf of the Hillary Clinton campaign, actually asked a judge to count the votes of people who are not registered in the state of Florida. That is some scary stuff. It's unprecedented, and it would have definitely create, created chaos at the polls. 
Do you have any concerns about Trump's statement during the debate and thereafter in effect that he would keep us in suspense and would not necessarily accept the results of the election? Well, what I would say is Donald Trump is a showman. I think that was a little bit of gamesmanship. Um, it was meant to rally his base. But look, at the end of the day, Donald Trump knows and believes in the integrity of our electoral process. Um, so I think it was just more about him being a showman um, and showing that he is clear Clearly not a politician, and he doesn't, um, and it's not political talk. It is not, um, he is definitely not PC. You've seen the polls, you've seen the projections from 538 and others that make Hillary Clinton the heavy favorite at this point. Do you think the polls are wrong, and if so, how and why? Well, I do think the polls are a little off for a couple of reasons. One thing, if you look during the primary, the polls were very inconsistent. In fact, the only thing consistent about the polls is that they were inconsistent. Um, but what I think is happening is that it's not counting what we're calling a shadow vote for Mr. Trump. We believe that there is a lot of people out there who are not being sampled by the pollsters and a lot of people who are not registered to vote who are clearly going to go out and vote for Mr. Trump. Now, what does that amount to? Is it 1 percent? Is it 3 percent? Is it 5 percent? We don't know. But what we do know is that the closer the polls are going to be, the more pronounced and more of an effect that shadow vote is going to have on the outcome of the elections. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Which cookie? Coming up, Charlie's cake. world of politics and how to deal with a race that's stressing people out. We let off our show with a look at why a lot of people just want this race to end. Clinton and Trump both have a good deal of baggage. They're the most unpopular nominees in modern history, and it turned ugly on both sides. And psychiatrists say it's driving up stress. Haley Hines shows us how it's also burning friendships and what we can do about it. She is a corporate shell. It's on TV. He's everything I would not want to be. It's all over social media. It's everywhere. Family, friends, it's, it's a constant conversation. Even at work, it's a confrontation. This year, it seems there's no escape from the political debate. I just want it to be over and I want to know who the winner is already. A new study done by the American Psychological Association found that 52% of adults, Republicans and Democrats, find the 2016 election to be a very or somewhat significant source of stress. Millennials and those over 71 are feeling it the most. 7% of Americans told a Monmouth University University poll, the election has actually cost them a friendship. People who let their friendship suffer because they disagree on politics are, in my opinion, not very mature. I think people can get angry and, it, you know, can can develop kind of a group think mentality and almost stop thinking for themselves. Dr. Wendy Rice of Rice Psychology Group in Tampa recently wrote a blog on preserving relationships despite the strain of differing political views. She has some advice. I think it's OK to not talk about it. <laughs> I think that if you're talking to somebody who's going to try to force their ideas down, you know, down your throat or you know that it's going to be really uncomfortable, it's OK to skip it in conversation. Some other tips from experts step away from social media. Digital breaks will help de-stress your mind. You can also channel your stress into something positive, like volunteering for a group you believe in. And if you do debate, focus on issues, not personal attacks. I think you can call a truce. I think you can have a safe zone. I think you maybe tonight is the debate. You can agree to talk about it tonight until this time, and then we have to turn it off and talk about other things. Well, that's our show. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow night. Okay, Charlie Belcher brings us a dose of humor to our show every week, except this week he was off. So for our weekend extra, we have to bring at least a dose of Charlie's world of politics. <laughs> Jason Alessi, there are many, many important polls out there, but maybe none as sweet as the Alessi poll. I agree. <laughs> I agree 100%. You're in charge of decorating the candidate cookies. Yes, I am. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure to that job. <laughs> yeah. you, you put a little more icing on a Trump than the Hillary, and the, oh, and the Democrats go crazy. Yeah. You put a little uh, too much on Hillary and not on Trump, the Republicans go nuts. Yes, absolutely. Now, you're stuck with these cookies for at least four years, so did you make a wise choice? Yes, I, yes that one. You can have any sure. cookie you want. The Hillary cookie. <laughs> You ever hear anybody arguing about politics? All the time. Really? Who do, who do you hear arguing about politics? All these adults. A lot of just negative stuff about the other parties and all that jazz, I guess. Yeah, jazz is a good, thank you for saying jazz. <laughs> jazz is a good way to say it. What's a Republican, do you know? 
No. Yeah. What, what's a what's a Democrat? Do you know? Mm-mm. Yeah. I was really hoping you could help me out on that one. No, I have never spoken to someone in Australia before, so that's a first for both of us. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up. I, oh, I, I um, I gotta go. Uh, g'day, mate. <laughs> ah, hello, Money Power Politics viewers. Charlie Belcher here. While Craig has been busy at the RNC and now the DNC, I have been guarding his desk, making a few long-distance phone calls on his phone, and uh, I've been eating Zaltoids. Craig has very fresh breath. Now I know why. But of course, it's time to check the mailbag. So, I don't even know who some of these people are. You listen to me, O'Reilly. Oh, hey, hey, no hey, Russell, Russell, I, gotta, I, I have some of your mail here. I'm the one delivering now because I do such a good job on money, power, politics that they want me to, you know, maybe I'll be the perm. Have a good day. Kayla Bullion says you're awesome. Probably meant that for Craig. I, I will pass that along, that Craig is awesome. Thank you, Kayla. Ah, welcome to my brain. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is what it looks like. Plenty of space. Oh, hey, what are you doing here? I'm left brain, I live here. Right, of course, yes, well, you look nice. What, what's with this sport coat? Did you not know you were gonna be on TV today? You, you put on a sport coat, you're gonna be on TV. What? Keep those emails coming, mppmailbag at yahoo.com. I guess that's it for me this week. Y'all take care now. Back to you, Craig. Thank you, Charlie. Well, we let off our show with a look at why a lot of people just want this race to end. Clinton and Trump both have a good deal of baggage. They're the most unpopular nominees in modern history, and it turned ugly on both sides. And psychiatrists say it's driving up stress. Haley Hines shows us how it's also burning friendships and what we can do about it. She is a corporate shell. It's on TV. It's everything I would not want to be. It's all over social media. It's everywhere. Family, friends, it's, it's a constant conversation. Even at work, it's a confrontation. This year, it seems there's no escape from the political debate. I just want it to be over and I want to know who the winner is already. A new study done by the American Psychological Association found that 52% of adults, Republicans and Democrats, find the 2016 election to be a very or somewhat significant source of stress. Millennials and those over 71 are feeling it the most. 7% of Americans told a Monmouth University University poll, the election has actually cost them a friendship. People who let their friendship suffer because they disagree on politics are, in my opinion, not very mature. I think people can get angry and, it, you know, can can develop kind of a group think mentality and almost stop thinking for themselves. Dr. Wendy Rice of Rice Psychology Group in Tampa recently wrote a blog on preserving relationships despite the strain of differing political views. She has some advice. I think it's okay to not talk about it. <laughs> I think that if you're talking to somebody who's going to try to force their ideas down, you know, down your throat or you know that it's going to be really uncomfortable, it's OK to skip it in conversation. Some other tips from experts step away from social media. Digital breaks will help de-stress your mind. You can also channel your stress into something positive, like volunteering for a group you believe in. And if you do debate, focus on issues, not personal attacks. I think you can call a truce. I think you can have a safe zone. I think you may be tonight is the debate you can agree to talk about it tonight until this time and then we have to turn it off and talk about other things well that's our show thank you for joining us and we will see you tomorrow night